As you may know, computing integrals can be quite complicated, and it may even be impossible to find the exact value. As a consequence, methods for approximating their value arise naturally. You may have already heard of deterministic approaches that tackle this problem, such as the Simpson's rule or the trapezoidal one. Being deterministic, these methods will provide the same approximation every time we compute it, since they have a closed formula. Now, what if we could use randomness to approximate the value of an integral? This is precisely the idea behind Monte Carlo integration. Let's begin with an intuitive example. We will approximate the area of the unit circle and thus pi. To do so, we will sample points at random in a square that contains the circle. Firstly, we can express the desired area in this way. Now, we can intuitively see that the ratio of the number of points that fall inside the circle to the total number of points should be similar to the ratio of the area of the circle to the area of the square. Since we can easily compute the area of the square, we can use this ratio to approximate the area of the circle. As expected, the probability that our approximation is accurate increases as we sample more points. Now, let's formalize this idea a bit more. In the previous example, what we did was to compute this integral, which can be seen as calculating the volume of the cylinder whose base is the unit circle and whose height is 1. It makes sense to ask, can we use the same idea to compute a diverse set of integrals? As we will see now, the answer is yes. To make the general argument, we want to understand exactly why Monte Carlo integration works for a wide range of integrals and understand the approximation error. To do so, we will use the concept of expected value of a random variable. If g is a function and x is a continuous random variable with density p then, by definition, the expected value of g applied to x is equal to the following integral over the support of x provided it converges absolutely. Now, we can see that if we take g to be f divided by the density function of x, we have that this expected value is exactly equal to our original integral. This holds as long as it is defined, namely, the integral converges absolutely. also need the strong law of large numbers, which states that if you choose a sequence of independent and identically distributed random variables with defined expected value mu, then the sample mean converges to mu almost surely with n. If the integral converges absolutely and we take n observations of g of x, each one independent and identically distributed, the law of large numbers tells us that the sample mean converges almost surely to the true expected value and therefore to the integral of f. So, for n sufficiently large, we can approximate this complicated integral simply by applying g to a set of randomly distributed points and taking the average. What is the approximation error of this method? To answer this question, we will use the central limit theorem. Given a sequence of independent and identically distributed random variables x sub i with expectation mu and finite, non-zero variance sigma squared, the sample mean satisfies that its standardization converges in distribution to a standard normal. We can expand the expectation of the sample mean. By linearity of the expectation, we can take the coefficient out and take the expectation of each term separately which is mu for each of them, since they are iid. Hence we can see that the expectation of the sample mean is mu. For the standard deviation, we will compute the variance first. We can take the coefficient squared out, and since they are iid, take the variance of each term separately, which is sigma squared for all of them. To obtain the standard deviation, take square roots. Now, we can see that the standard deviation of the sample mean is sigma divided by the square root of n.
We can see that, for large n, the sample mean is approximately normally distributed. This is because the standardized sample mean is approximately a standard normal, which implies that the sample mean has an approximate distribution given by a normal with mean mu and standard deviation sigma over the square root of n. recall our integral estimator. We can define random variables, y sub i, as the ith term in the sum. We can see that our estimator is the sample mean of these random variables. Since the y sub i are independent and identically distributed, and their expected value is equal to the desired integral, we just need their variance, and thus their standard deviation to be finite to use the central limit theorem. We can compute it. We know that the expected value of y sub i is i, the integral we want to approximate. For the other term we can use the definition of expected value. Therefore, to apply the CLT, we require this quantity to be finite and non-zero. From now we will assume it is. Nonetheless, observe that if it were zero, we would always obtain the correct value. Moreover, even if the variance were infinite, our estimator would still converge almost surely to the value of the integral. However, the convergence would not be sufficiently rapid to yield a reliable computational approximation. With this in mind, we now take square roots to get the standard deviation. Applying the CLT, we can approximate the distribution of our estimator by a normal distribution with mean i and standard deviation sigma over the square root of n for large n. Now we want to know the probability of our estimation error to be less than or equal to a fixed upper bound. We will express this bound in terms of the standard deviation of the normal approximation. So, we want to know the probability that the error is less than some constant t, multiplied by the standard deviation of the normal. Using the properties of the absolute value, we can express the probability equivalently like this. Next, divide by sigma over the square root of n in the inner inequality. By the normal approximation we obtained, we can substitute the middle term by a standard normal z to get an approximation of this probability, and hence the desired probability will be approximately the following integral. The value of this integral increases really quickly with t, as we can see now. For example, when t equals 3, the probability is approximately 99.7%. We can see that the upper bound of the error is inversely proportional to the square root of the number of samples. Hence, under the previous assumption that sigma is finite, it is clear that it tends to zero as n goes to infinity. Since these approximation is reliable for sufficiently large n, we can always choose n large enough so that the probability of our error being below a fixed upper bound is approximately 99.7%. Observe that we could have chosen t to make the probability arbitrarily close to 1. Thus we can see that the error is of order 1 over the square root of n. It is important to observe that this order of error is independent of the dimension of the integral, which is a great advantage over many deterministic methods since most of them see their efficiency diminish rapidly with dimension. Finally, it is worth noting that the smaller sigma is, the faster our estimator converges to the true value. An important question is, what distribution should we use to take the samples? There are different possible choices. The simplest option is the uniform distribution. Its density function is constant over its support, omega and equals the reciprocal of the volume of omega. Its main advantages are its simplicity and ease of implementation. It is a good choice if we seek a general purpose method to approximate a variety of integrals, provided the integrands are sufficiently well behaved, and hence avoid crafting a tailored sampling distribution for each function. However, the uniform distribution is not always the best choice. To improve accuracy, variance reduction techniques are used. These seek to reduce the variance, and thus the standard deviation of the random variable from which we take the samples. One of these techniques is important sampling. 
Recall the expression of the standard deviation, sigma, of the variable we are sampling from. The choice of the density function p can make or break our method, since it determines whether sigma is large or small. The optimal choice of p, that is, the one that minimizes sigma is the absolute value of f divided by the integral over omega of the absolute value of f. You may be thinking, we can't choose this one, right? We would need to compute an integral similar to the one we want to approximate. This is true, but knowing the optimal choice will be useful to come up with good enough alternatives. Let's prove that it minimizes sigma by proving it minimizes sigma squared, that is, the variance, to avoid that outer square root. Observe that, since i squared is constant, to minimize the variance we should minimize the integral. Firstly, we substitute our choice of p in the expression. Now we will prove that any choice of p will result in greater or equal variance. For this, we will apply the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality for integrals to these two functions, g, defined as absolute value of f divided by the square root of p and h, defined as the square root of p. First, substitute g and h. Then, we simplify algebraically. Since p is a density function, the integral over its support is 1. Finally, subtract i squared from both sides to derive the inequality that proves our initial choice was optimal, with the left-hand term representing the variance from our choice and the right-hand one the general variance. How does this help us in finding a good p? Observe that the optimal choice is just a normalizing constant times the absolute value of f. The best we can do is choose a distribution whose density function behaves similarly to the absolute value of f. That is, a distribution that places more weight on the regions of the domain where the absolute value of f is larger, those that contribute more significantly to the value of the integral. Now, let's take a look at an example of how we would choose a good sampling distribution. Given the function f defined as the reciprocal of 1 plus x squared, we would like to compute the integral of f between 0 and 5. We can observe that the absolute value of f equal to f in this case, takes larger values as we approach zero and smaller values as x increases. We can take as distribution the truncated exponential whose density function we plot now. It is a good choice because it has a similar behavior to the absolute value of f, and hence it will reduce the variance of our sampling random variable. For the rest of this video, we will stick with the uniform distribution to define the exact method we will follow to approximate any integral with a sufficiently well-behaved integrand. Recall our general estimator, which we can write in this form. Now substitute the constant density function of the uniform distribution, which is the reciprocal of the volume of omega. Finally, simplify algebraically. However, what if we want to compute the integral of a function over a domain, d, that is difficult to sample from? For example, this starfish-like domain is not easy to sample from uniformly. A possible solution is to rewrite the integral over a rectangular domain, omega, where sampling is easy via the indicator function of the original domain. Thus, we have the following equality. This way, we can sample points uniformly on an easy domain. Furthermore, the original domain could be enclosed within a union of boxes, providing a tighter cover and thus improving accuracy. One can then integrate over each box separately and sum the results. However, we won't delve into the details here. Let's apply this idea to our starfish-like domain. To begin with, we wrap it inside a box. Now we take random samples uniformly. As an example, we will take x squared plus y squared as our function f. It can be proven that it satisfies the hypotheses required for convergence at order 1 over square root of n. We only need to evaluate the function on the points inside the original domain, since the extended function is zero outside of it. Next we'll compute the quantities needed for our estimator. We can calculate the volume of the box easily. 
and the number of samples is 1000. Now we compute the sum of the function values of the samples. Finally, we use the formula for our estimator with uniform distribution, substituting the values we just obtained. Finally, evaluating the integral in polar coordinates yields an approximate value of 1.76, accurate to two decimal places. Hence, the error in the Monte Carlo estimate was relatively small. A more accurate approximation could be obtained by increasing the number of samples, although this was not done here so as to avoid the additional cost of rendering the animations. That's it for today. I hope this video gave you a clearer idea of how Monte Carlo integration works and why it's so powerful. If you found it useful, feel free to give it a like. Thanks for watching.